We're ready to begin, ladies and gentlemen. Please stand for the <laughs> national anthem. Andrew William to lead us in prayer. Can we bow our heads in prayer? Gracious God, we thank you for another day that you have made. We thank you for your protection and guidance that has brought us thus far. Lord, we're especially grateful on this auspicious occasion to celebrate the legacy of Agri Brown in this distinguished lecture 2019. Lord, we pray, bless all those who contributed to this event, those that worked very hard ensuring that this was made possible. We thank you for everyone in attendance and even those that are on their way. We humbly ask that you just take control over tonight's proceedings and be glorified in everything we do. We leave everything in your hands in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Shakur.
featured speaker, Dr. Ellen Campbell, is the Associate Professor at the University of Technology in Jamaica, faculty and staff of the University of the West Indies and the University of Technology in Jamaica, other specially invited guests, students, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the celebration of Carimac's Open Week and in particular, our flagship event, the annual Agri Brown Distinguished Lecture 2019. My name is Nadine McLeod and it is indeed my pleasure and indeed an honor to be your master of ceremonies for this evening's proceedings. This evening we honor the life and work of Professor Agri Brown, a trailblazer in media and communication education here University of the West Indies. Professor Agri Brown served as the director of CARIMAC from 1979 through to 2002 when he became the Dean of the Faculty of Humanities and Education. Professor Brown wrote several texts on Caribbean media and industry with which he was well acquainted both as practitioner and researcher. He's remembered by colleagues and students as an exemplary media educator. The annual Agri Brown Distinguished Lecture Series provides an academic yet social space for us to reflect on the role of media here in the Caribbean. This evening's lecture, The Politics of Health Communication, aptly reflects Agri Brown's lifelong concern for two critical areas of Caribbean development, and those two areas are politics and communication. We now invite Dr. Livingston White, the director of the Caribbean School of Media and Communication, Caribbean, to bring greetings. Thank you, Ms. McLeod. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our public lecture. Today, we host the ninth staging of the Caramac Agri Brown Distinguished Lecture to commemorate one of the iconic figures of the UWI, the late Professor Emeritus Agri Brown, who served our university in various capacities, such as Director of Caramac, Dean of the Faculty of Humanities and Education, and the university's public orator, among his other many public roles. I recall taking a final year course with Professor Agri Brown, Communication, Analysis, and Planning to CAP2. In that year, I was the only one in the class. <laughs> My classmates looked at me and said, you know, you are brave to be taking this course, CAP2. It was a final year course that required help. do I keep a job? But no, you need to solve the problem and not maintain the problem to ensure job security. You need to write yourself out of that job. And so he was a man of radical ideas, yes, uh, promoting this idea of sustainability and the fact that we should solve problems to ensure that they do not recur. I am happy that we've been able to sustain this event as a memorial to Professor Brown's outstanding contribution to CARIMAC, to the UWI, and to education in the Caribbean as a whole. I want to acknowledge also the work of all the directors who followed after Professor Brown. Dr. Marion de Brun, who is not here, but I think she's on her way. She's not here at the moment, but she taught us at CARIMAC uh, I think we learned from her this notion of fundraising. You know, she was able to guide us on the caramat.com project, and we learned a lot about bringing in projects and so on. Dr. Knut James, another former director, helped to 
sustain the place as we went through a number of transitions and we started our very aggressive curriculum review where we saw a single BA in media and communication transformed into three new undergraduate programs in journalism, integrated marketing communication, and digital media production. And then came along Professor Hopton Dunn, who introduced self-financing uh, undergraduate programs, the Bachelor of Fine Arts in Animation and Film Production, and also started a number of new master's programs in integrated marketing communication. And I'm pleased to announce the media management program, which we began working on with the team at Caramac, has been finally approved, and we're now looking to recruit students into that master's program. So we want to thank all the directors who have contributed to building on the foundation uh, that Professor Agri Brown would have started here at Caramac. I want to also congratulate all the final year students of the Caramac's Integrated Marketing Communication IMC program and their course coordinator, Mr. Alpha Obika, for organizing this event, which forms part of a graded assignment. One of the other achievements which I forgot to mention earlier is that under the leadership of uh, Professor Brown and the team at Caramac, we were able to transform the institute into a school. And so in August of 2017, Caramac became the Caribbean School of Media and Communication. You know, we're now planning our 50th anniversary, which should be happening in the next six years. And, you know, we, <laughs> we are thinking of all the work we will have to do to get that going. And I know we'll have your support. And I think your presence here this evening, you know, your interest in Open Week, your interest in the development of the curriculum at Caramac shows us that we have your support. As I look around the room, I see many former students, past students of Caramac. I see former lecturers. I see colleagues who've worked with us over the years. And I want to really thank you all for showing up this afternoon, this evening, to show us your support. Professor Brown has left a great legacy upon which we must continue to build. Your presence here indicates that we have your support in continuing to develop Caramac, which must now address new challenges related to education and training in media and communication across the Caribbean. All of this while working towards realizing UWI's strategic vision of becoming an excellent global university rooted in the Caribbean. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, welcome to Caramac. Thank you for your continued support, and do enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you very much, Dr. White. We will now have greetings from Professor Donna Hope. Thank you so much and good evening. And of course, I would like to extend my welcome on behalf of the Faculty of Humanities and Education to all of us who are gathered here this evening, Dr. Livingston White, Director of CARMAC, Professor Hopeson Dunn, former director and other former directors, Dr. Susan Francis Brown, widow of former director and dean, Professor Emeritus, Agri Brown, who we are celebrating today, your legacy and your work. Of course, our speaker, Dr. Ellen Campbell Grizzle, um, who is also a former student of Caramac and alumni with who I shared time at Caramac as also as an alumni. There are many alumni gathered here this evening. I want to welcome all of you and of course all the faculty and staff members of the School of Car Caribbean, Med Caribbean School of Media and Communication and of the Faculty of Humanities and the University also welcoming visitors from the University of Technology who are gathered here and others who are here with us. I just, of course, have to specially mention Alma Makien, under whom, whose tutelage I <coughs> obtained my bachelor's in media and communication. Of course, this ninth annual Caramac Agribound Distinguished Lecture marks for us here at the 
University of the West Indies and the Faculty of Humanities and Education, one of the important aspects of our outreach activities that form a part of how we interface not only with the people on our campus, our internal stakeholders, but also how we interface with our external stakeholders to showcase the best of who we are. Phones are off on silent and vibrate. <laughs> Thank you. And in coming here this evening, I'm um, asked, of course, to bring greetings on behalf of the faculty and on behalf of Professor Waibinti Wari Boko, who is called away to a competing event right now. I ruminated on the discussions we're going to have this evening all about Professor Agri Brown. Some of us were lucky enough to be with him. And also on the topic that Dr. Ellen Campbell Grizzle will be speaking with us about the politics of health communication. Professor Agri Brown was particularly moved by issues of politics, culture, and communication. And I do my work on culture, some of it on communication, and quite a bit of it on politics. We live in a world today, as individuals, where we are surrounded by, deluged by, drowning in a huge amount of information. We are struggling with information overload. We are dealing with, it, with information coming to us through various portals, and I should have brought my smartphone up here. Many of us have become almost slaves to this little piece of technology. And I remember Agri Brown reminding us in many of our classes about technology being something. <clears throat> and the, ex the example he gave us was the Aki trees on the campus, which become the purview of many gentlemen who, of course, use the Aki's for their own enrichment. And he explains to us very cogently that when you attach a piece of wire to the end of a stick, to reach the Akis that are furthest from you, whether on the ground or on a branch that you can't reach, even if you climb it, that stick with the little piece of wire attached is technology. Because technology really, at its basis level, are really the tools that allow you as human beings to mediate your relationship with your environment. That was, for me, a very important understanding of technology as it is applied to our lives. Because we think of technology really as high technology smartphones and tablets and computers and the kinds of information that we can access using these technological portals. And I want to ask the question, as a part of my greetings and brief welcome today, is it that when we are drowning in the kinds of information that comes to us through these portals, and we all have email accounts, some of us have several that we must manage, personal and institutional. Most of us are using WhatsApp, we are texting, most of us also are on Facebook at some point in time, and some of us tweet quite liberally. I don't. I really don't have the time. A lot of us are on Instagram, whether we are stalking things or we are posting. Um, and I post maybe once every two or three weeks, right, students? I barely post, but I do look. WhatsApp, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, email, the internet, and the various forms of social media, a great deal of information is coming to us. A lot of it is already prepackaged, carrying a lot of very political tropes. Eh? We are not clear on what many of them are saying. Is it then that there is full communication achieved? Are we all sharing the same meanings that are the intention of those who created these pieces of information. And so in a, as a part of our discussion this evening, and I'm really looking forward to what Dr. Ellen Campbell Grizzle will be delivering this evening, as a part of our outreach here from the University of the West Indies, as a part of the information that we put out about who we are, and to celebrate the life and the contribution and the legacy of Professor Emeritus Agri Brown, I want to leave you with this thought as we drown in the deluge of information in this 21st century, as we wade through all the memes and all the themes that come to us from social media, as you crawl through the emails that are struggling for your attention, are we achieving full communication? Are we aware of the kinds of tropes that are loaded and packaged and sent to us in these pieces that are sent to us, sometimes quite anonymously, some of them seeming to be entertainment, a lot of them carrying important information that we must tackle on a daily basis. Politics, culture, and communication, those are the themes that I, for my own life, have underscored the contribution of Professor Agri Brown. And of course, as I ex exit the stage, I want to welcome you again to this ninth annual Distinguished Lecture, Professor Agri Brown Lecture Series, from Caramac through the Faculty of Humanities and for us here at the University of the West Indies, Mona. And thank you so much for sharing with us and do wish you all a great evening. Thank you so much.
Thank you very much, Professor Donna Hope. Before we move on with the program, just some administrative things that we have to take care of. Just reminding you to put your cell phones on vibrate or turn it off. And also to let you know that we are trending on Twitter. Are we trending yet? Hashtag CABDL 2019, that's one. And the other one is hashtag join the legacy. We can start trending by using those hashtags. We're also streaming live. If you'd like to stream live, you can just wave to this gentleman right here on Facebook as we use the technology. Are we achieving full communication as we use all the platforms? Food for thought, Dr. Hope. Thank you very much. I now invite saxophonist Anika Young and Mario Henton to present their rendition of What a Wonderful World. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
not a round of applause. Thank you, Onika and Omario, who are final year students of entertainment and cultural enterprise management here at the university. And now for the moment. In 2019, Carrimac Agri Brown Distinguished Lecture. To introduce our guest speaker for this evening is Carrimac final year student, Miss Brittany, Brittany, Miss Brittany Clark. Master of Ceremonies, Ms. Nadine McLeod, Deputy Dean of Graduate Studies and Research here at Uni University of the West Indies, Mona, Professor Donna Hope, Director of the Caribbean School of Media and Communication, Dr. Livingston White, President of the University of Technology, Jamaica, Professor Stephen Vassiani, Dr. Fra Susan Francis Brown, wife of the late Professor Agri Brown and other family members, featured speaker, Dr. Ellen Campbell Grizzle, Associate Professor at the University of the West of Technology, faculty and staff of the University of the West Indies and the University of Technology, Jamaica, other specially invited guests, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Dr. Ellen Campbell Grizzle can be described as a Jill of all trades. She is a researcher, a trained media practitioner, an associate professor and former dean of the College of Health Sciences at the University of Technology, Jamaica. A behavior change communication specialist and a registered pharmacist with over 40 years experience. Dr. Ellen Campbell Grizzle is the fifth of seven children. She was born in the parish of St. James, but her family later moved to Westmoreland where she began her educational journey at the Grange Hill Primary School. She excelled academically and was later rewarded a government scholarship to St. Andrew High School for Girls. After the completion of her secondary education, she worked for two years at the Pan American Airlines. In a newspaper interview, Dr. Campbell Grizzle revealed that her first love was journalism. Nonetheless, her passion for journalism was to be ignited in a unique way, as after working for over a decade as a pharmacist, Dr. Campbell Grizzle applied to and was, accept and was accepted by Carmack. In fact, while she was completing her bachelor's degree in media and communication here at Carmack, she was pursuing her bachelor's degree in pharmacy at UTEC. Dr. Campbell Grizzle would go on to complete a master's degree in communication for social and behavioral change here at Carmack and a master's degree in public policy and man management from the University of London. She returned to the UA, Mona, where she was awarded a PhD in communication studies with a focus on health communication. A well-known health writer, her research and publication portfolio spans the areas of health lit literacy, substance abuse prevention, and gender-based violence remediation. She has been lead researcher for a number of projects. Some of the most recent include the development of the Medical Cannabis Enterprise, Project Livity, a national health fund funded initiative aimed at producing Jamaica's first national food consumption survey and a substance abuse tertiary study on the patterns and prevalence of drug abuse and use in tertiary institutions. Dr. Campbell Grizzle received the Institute of Jamaica's Bronze Musgrave Medal for her contribution to science in 2012. In 2017, the government of Jamaica honored her with the Order of Distinction in the Commander class. Ladies and gentlemen, kindly join me in welcoming to the platform or speaker for this ninth can Carmack Annual Agri Brown Distinguished Lecture, Dr. Dr. Ellen Campbell Grizzle. Thank you. If it's free, Ellington, give them a <laughs> that. In 
information. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. <laughs> Our master of ceremonies, Mr. Nadine McLeod, just permit me to acknowledge a couple of folks in the audience. I just have to um, just call out some people. They are all distinguished ladies and gentlemen, but there are some folks in here that I have to, to single out. Um, of course, Dr. Livingston White and uh, the students who invited me to be here and to participate in, the, in this event. I want to thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, Professor Hopeton Dunn, I promised to call you out, sir. I did the PhD because you encouraged me to do it. I just want to declare that. <laughs> and I'm so pleased that you were able to find time to sit with us this afternoon. I don't see Dr. Marjan, but De Bruyne, but I know she's coming. Um, somebody I've worked with since leaving Caramac and before. Dr. Suzanne Francis Brown and family. Thank you for coming, and, 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 and I'm going to speak about Professor Agri, who I had a long odyssey with, <laughs> as I did a PhD, <laughs> in which he was, of course, my second reader. Uh, Professor Giles, AVP, Haldane Johnson from UTEC. I don't see President Vassiani, promised he would be here. Professor Donna Hope. Deputy Dean, I don't know what to call Donna now, um, but we, as she said, we shared some time here at Caramac. Uh, Mrs. Dean, Mercedes Dean, Registrar from UTEC, Dr. Janet Campbell-Shelley, my Dean, Faye Ellington, who is my friend from a very, very long time, and of course, I want to single out this, um, the students, the UTEC family, many of them are here this, this evening, and of course, you distinguished ladies and gentlemen, again, good evening. I, I think it's just a wonderful word. This is such a, <laughs> it's such an honor for me to be, be here. I never dreamed or dreamt that this would ever happen that I would be you know, speaking on an occasion like this. And I'm really humbled by the opportunity to do so. Ladies and gentlemen, there are intersections between politics and health communication. Based on the evidence, health communication, which we call behavior change communication campaigns that are theory-based, meticulously designed, and comprehensive in scope, can overcome the challenge of political obstruction. Such interventions should aim to improve knowledge, shift attitudes, and modify behavior in order to even the odds of success that is determined by the monitoring and measuring of proxies to required behavior, actual behavior change achieved after engagement with the intervention. The tipping point may be achieved long after the intervention has ended. I could end there, Fini. Taught, done. However, even Prof. Agri, Brown, master of brevity with substance, would recognize that I need to say much more. So I will address the topic, the politics of health communication, by the weaving of nuggets from my journey through a PhD process here at UWI, in which Professor Agri was my very active second reader. I will share with you the ways in which our interaction shaped my intellectual stance toward the integration of health communication theory into practice. I know that attitudes shift and behaviors change, but I'm weary about claims of miraculous conversion, and I'm incremental and restrained in making claims of success. I came to know Professor Agra Brown like many Caramac graduates who in the, attended this school, now institute, now school, during the time when Prof. Brown served as director. 
I was his student twice over. He engraved in my brain the most efficient yet profound definition of communication. And I'm going to ask all graduates of Caramac to, to share, speak loudly about this definition that Professor Brown shared with us. Could you please? The transfer of meaning between intelligences. All of us learned that definition. Professor Brown was an exponent of brevity with substance in speech and writing. So our in-class tests were assigned word limits. Anything beyond 500 words or sometimes 250 words was not marked. You therefore grew to internalize the meaning of the word salient and knew how to express the most important facts up front. For me, entering Caramac as an experienced pharmacist and scientist, I struggled with the idea of word economy. In the end, I did get high praises from Dr. Majan de Bruyne for my writing. Some say that was a rarity. Uh, and, you know, I was very pleased of that comment from Dr. Dr. Majan. Not an, not an easy achievement at all. I want to clarify my professional niches for you so that you can better understand my perspectives. I am a health communication specialist and social pharmacist. I've been engaged in establishing the first health research translation unit within a Caribbean university with the aim of providing health information for the public from bench to bedside, as we say. I have worked in the area of substance abuse treatment and prevention. Recently, we completed Project Liberty, Jamaica's first national food consumption study in an effort to understand the eating patterns of our people. I was part of the writing and implementation team of FIWI Jamaica that focused on combating spousal abuse, reducing violence against women, supporting programs organized by LGBT people, and the human trafficking initiatives of the security forces. At the end of FIWI Jamaica, a tolerance index was generated. Now as a member of the International Advisory Group of None in Three, I give advice to the project managers and researchers from time to time. None in Three is an international multi-centered project with headquarters at Huddersfield University, England and locally offices at UTEC, local offices at UTEC, Jamaica. None in Three focuses on research in the area of violence against women and girls with the purpose of developing serious games to combat this problem. Importantly, I am assigned to Utah, Jamaica to its medical, cannabis, and herbal enterprise to increase the university's involvement in the research and business opportunities that this emerging area offers. My relevance, I think, to this wide breadth of activities is made possible by competencies gained through excellent grounding in a science-based health profession and superlative training in the field of communication. To those of us who are Agra Brown's undergraduate students, we know how much he encouraged iconoclastic thinking. <laughs> he introduced us to the topic of semiotics and gave us practical examples of the extent to which our identification of items, acceptance of behaviors, and interpretation of events are culturally bound. He warned us about biases and the danger of overestimating our importance. We knew that Professor Brown celebrated the work of Stuart Hall. Intellectually, they were kindred spirits. Stuart Hall, the Jamaican-born British critical theorist, posited that culture is defined as a space of interpretive, interpretative struggle and that the media not only reflects reality but also produces it while reproducing the dominant cultural order. According to Hall, the role of culture in the construction of meaning is primary because it implies sharing conceptual maps and systems classification and representations. This understanding would assume greater importance later when I undertook the odyssey of writing a dissertation here at Carmack with Professor Agra Brown as my second reader. 
These lessons shaped my approach to the preparation of health communication campaigns and interpretation of their outcomes. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm not complaining about my PhD experience. I look back today and relive the triumphs and tribulations of that time. <laughs> it was a period of my most profound intellectual enlightenment. I had the best of both worlds in my supervisor and second reader. My supervisor, Dr. Shahid Mohammed, was excellent. He, proposed de he possessed deep knowledge about health communication theories and their value in constructing the foundations of health communication behavior change campaigns that could aid evaluation. He was a master at identifying these theories that best link variables together in order to explain and predict events or situations. I hope that I have developed half of his ability to do so. Professor Brown insisted that any notion of breaking new ground in the field of health communication with Caribbean relevance must include an intellectual excavation of cultural resonance, representations, <laughs> the derivation of meaning and truth, the blending of cultural constructs with health behavior theories opened up an area of inquiry that could propel the field of health communication theory. We felt that it was inevitable that new knowledge would emerge from my dissertation. Health communication researchers seek to understand the determinants of health behavior and the process of health behavior change. According to Weinstein, despite large empirical literature, there is still no consensus that certain models of health behavior are more accurate than others, that certain variables are more influential than others, or that certain behaviors or situations are understood better than others. From the standpoint of the Caribbean, it is always necessary to carry out some winnowing in order to make progress. How then could health communication be defined in a way that captured its reliance on sound theoretical bases in the shaping of interventions to share knowledge and modify health behaviors. Initially, it was easier to state its purpose as a use of communication to improve knowledge, promote appropriate attitudes, to modify human behavior and prevent illness, and as Grave Elder Booth and Mills conclude, to protect individuals from harm. In shaping the health message, one must look beyond the obvious to the non-obvious changes that will occur on exposure to a message and the impact of this process on the receptivity and acceptance of the message and vice versa. Audience and participants, and participants are neither tabula rasa nor passive recipients of information. The process of health communication and the effectiveness of health communication campaigns is proven in praxis. Health communication can, for me, became for me the sharing of meaning through theory-based interventions that aim to increase knowledge, maintain appropriate human behavior, or modify inappropriate behaviors. Behavior change campaigns are complex undertakings that aim for the long game of sustained shifting attitude and behavior. Professor Brown was a tough second reader as many of his graduate students will attest. He queried the many assumptions of health communication theories and pushed me to interrogate their cultural dimensions and to critique them. He used a brisk Socratic method to fuel my critical thinking. The result was innumerable rewrites. <laughs> Professor Brown would say, this model, the health belief model, assumes that the prospect of death is the ultimate fear and greatest cudgel to persuade persons toward appropriate behavior. Is this true in Jamaican inner cities? The health belief model describes four key constructs and perceptions that underpin health behaviors. These perceptions account for people's readiness to act and cues to action that activate readiness and stimulate overt behavior. Professor Brown's question was on point. Since our social scientists tell us of the extent to which the sense of being disrespected remains a potent force embedded into the Jamaican psyche, 
arguably equal to the prospect of death. Further, if perception is a linchpin in the framing of health communication and the message is being promoted, the perception of disrespect may be a powerful motivator in some cases than the fear of death. In the, in the context of Jamaica, the perception of being disrespected as a consequence of the negative health effect of an illness must be considered as a factor. Should one develop different messages for different parts of a society, or ought we to consider using a variety of media to reach different groups? Ideally, maybe. But in the world of limited resources in which we dwell, what can we do? One approach I proposed was to do a diagnostic using the Prochaska and Declamenta stages of change model to set priorities based on where the most vulnerable group in a po population stands on the continuum of pre-contemplation, contemplation, decision determination stage, and action or maintenance. If we could apply further analysis using Adjian's theory of planned behavior, we could improve our understanding and per perhaps predict an individual's intention to perform a given behavior. Simply put, according to Adjian, the stronger the intention to engage in a behavior, the more likely it is that the person will perform the behavior. The individual's perception of his or her capacity to perform a behavior is very important. Of course, consideration of external factors is essential. For a person may believe that he or she determines outcomes by their own behavior, called internal locus of control, but perceive that their chances of being successful in completing the behavior or obtaining a desired outcome is limited, low perceived behavioral control. I join with many health communication planners who are of the view that no theory will suffice. No one theory will suffice. So, so many times I have mixed several theories in planning a campaign such as the Prochaska and Decremente stages of chain and Adjian's theory of planned behavior in determining campaign priorities. Interestingly, by 2010, the Organization of American States Drug Abuse Prevention Service introduced this notion of intention to use as a critical marker in youth surveys and as a predictor of future drug burden. Health communication relies on persuading individuals to shift their perception of reality or truth so as to act in a particular way. I had to consider the power of communication to create shared meaning through knowledge that assumes the authority of truth. According to Foucault, knowledge linked to power not only assumes the authority of truth, but has the power to make itself true. A major barrier to behavior change is deeply held beliefs that have attained the status and power of knowledge, the status of, of the, sorry, I'm sorry, has a, the status and the power of knowledge within a crucible that is historically and culturally bound. As we say, belief kills and belief cures. As I neared the end of my dissertation, Professor Brown asked from left field, what about the influence of politics on health communication? Another rewrite. He stated, this field of health communication is a contested space. Using Howard LaSalle's definition of politics as politics about who gets what, when, and how, we get a sense of the pervasive nature of politics and the power that it can unleash. I understand the extent to which partisan politics in small societies like ours could affect the outcome of health communication change campaigns. In many ways, the support of the Minister of Health, Member of Parliament, or Community Done can make all the difference. Sometimes we Jamaicans say politics at work. There are many times, types of politics that carry different types of power. In the recognition of this, I learned to implant contingencies to massage or mitigate power plays in every health communication campaign. Political power expressed as office politics. Office politics. Professional politics, campus politics, partisan politics, ministerial politics, bureaucratic politics, and global politics, or any other form. 
I have seen power directed to the overriding of evidence. For many years, surveys had shown the danger of tobacco smoking and, and science had proved the destructive nature of tobacco on the human body, yet health promoters could not get the necessary legislation passed to control the sale of tobacco. Big tobacco did not yield easily. It took the power of the Minister of Health, Dr. Fenton Ferguson, who was convinced by the evidence to take the bull by the horns and usher in tobacco control legislation into Jamaica. <laughs> Geopolitics is rife in the field of medical cannabis. Powerful notion, there we go, powerful nations are playing chess while we are playing tiddlywinks. I like to say, the advancement of the science behind cannabis is moving rapidly. For its size, Jamaica has a scientific community that can operate at the high value end of this $150 billion per annum industry. However, we are being weighed down by a local and global perception that Jamaica is only a weed smoker's paradise. There are people who benefit from this type of branding. Investors are coming by the droves to buy Jamaican cannabis for export to other countries where the high levels of value are to be generated. It is time to plan to combat this perception through a coalition of academics, clinicians, cultivators, and patients. The power of an expert to challenge assertions about the relationship of sugary drinks and diabetes Barbara, I had to get this in. Recently commanded our attention. A sugary drink reduction campaign was ambling along quite peacefully. Out of nowhere, it comes up against a public correction voiced by Professor Morrison, <laughs> a world-leading diabetologist and Jamaica's Director General of Science and Technology. According to Professor Morrison, sugary drinks are a possible risk factor for diabetes, not necessarily a cause. He said, the science behind the issue must be accurately, accurately represented and construed. No leeway for misinformation allowing misinterpretation. I think the sugary drinks kerfuffle brought great attention to the campaign. After all, conflict is a reliable news value. <laughs> the sugary drink billboards in our state can cause and not the more powerful will cause. I'm not sure of the impact of this Tommy teacup on the persuasive strength of the campaign. That is for another time. In the execution of a behavior change project named Utah Cares, plan to change the norm of irrational hostility toward gay people in a Jamaican university, project leaders face the wrath of the powerful religious lobby groups versus advocates for the rights of the LGBT people. The incident that sparked the mob violence was frightening to behold as it went viral on social media. We were clear that our response would not solve the national problem that resulted in intermittent re reports of mob violence in Jamaica. Our intervention was based primarily on the diffusion of innovation theory with use of first adopters as important influences to convey important messages or appropriate messages. During the implementation phase, we were affected by shifting sentiments. The Professor Brendan Bain incident put a dent in our progress. We carried the intervention to conclusion and are encouraged that since 2012, UTEC Jamaica has not witnessed mob violence on its campus. There have been no beatings of alleged gay people and there is heightened consciousness of the need to care for the mental health of all our students. Five years later, it appears that our campaign has been effective. My current PhD candidate is doing his dissertation on the lived experiences of LGBT students at UTEC Jamaica and says that he was inspired to do so by the incident at UTEC on November 1, 2012. His findings will give us some indication as to whether we have made any progress in addressing the fear, vulnerability, and insecurity that our LGBT students addressed in the focus groups at the time. Utah Jamaica has many retentions of UTEC CARES intervention that was used to cauterize what we call the troubles 
including a diversity policy. I recall Professor Agra Brown's unique way of motivating his students. Ellen, you're about to finish the marathon. Or, Ellen, have you fired me? <laughs> or, Ellen, you need a swift kick in the butt. Get it done. <laughs> I recall that at the end of my PhD odyssey, Dr. Shahid was satisfied that I had given the dis dissertation all I had. Prof. Agri was a different story. <laughs> he said dryly, Ellen, you have completed the ma marathon, now to the defense. I suppose if I could tell Professor Brown today that I hold two copyrights and have developed several behavior change programs across the Caribbean, he would say calmly, I expected nothing less. I take away lessons from my many experiences. Today I use a robust and relevant theoretical basis as the foundation for behavior change interventions. This first phase of the process is iterative and consultative. The implementation is always systematic and concerted. The plan often displayed as a map or a grid that shows the interconnectedness of the concepts and the timing of each factor. I use a type of pest analysis to configure associated variables and possible responses to them. And yet, with all of this attention to detail, it is extremely difficult to predict the tipping point. Indeed, as Malcolm Gladwell suggests, the tipping point may come after the campaign is over. In this regard, I recall the two is too many Two is better than too many campaign. Oh, yes. Remember the days of Panther and Pearl? Yes. <laughs> this campaign brought our total fertility rate down from 4.1 in the 1970s to about two in 2017. This is a real palpable mark of success. The original campaign was a combination of messages, training, and community-based engagement. I know that the community-based aspect of the program came to an end a long time ago. And then we saw the introduction of what Donna Hope and Professor Brown would call technology, the morning after pill. This intervention is now a remedy of choice that has surpassed the use of regular family planning pills. It is worthy to note that people who need emergency contraceptives are not people who use condoms. People who engage in unprotected sex are more vulnerable to sexually transmitted diseases. At the intersection of family planning and HIV prevention, two important messages have collided. And the one that is promoting the use of emergency contraceptives based on the report of sales from the field is winning. It is clear that some deliberation and recalibration of the current version of Jamaica's family planning campaign is needed at this time. <laughs> like the family campaign of the 1990s, behavior change programs can take a long time to achieve their goals. This can irk policymakers who are usually on a short political timeline. Wise behavior change planners are pragmatists. They give allowance for political timelines and push the important sensational and eye-catching elements up front. However, the excitement that a campaign generates should never be its goal. Generating excitement is wonderful for engaging an audience and is therefore an important stage. This has to be managed to avoid the bastardization of a campaign. Bandura speaks in his social learning theory of the need to continue the intervention through community networks after the media campaign has ended. Shula posits that an effective mass media campaign can set the preconditions for change and disperse information. However, it is through observational learning, peer-to-peer -peer influences, and positive reinforcements that we increase the chances that the behavior is adopted and repeated. This process of adoption is not linear but circular and often difficult to track. In the behavior change discipline, proxies are often used to measure success long after the excitement has ended. As a campaign cycles through its various phases, 
Theorists argue as to whether attitude must change before behavior does. I have become ambivalent on that point, and I'm seeking to frame a theoretical landscape that accommodates behavior change before associated attitude shift. Having said all of that, I want to spend the remaining time to share some observations on two Jamaican campaigns. Of course, there are many other programs in progress. Some like Jamaica moves are in the early excitement phase that must mature before one can comment on its effectiveness. I do not know the design of the program, but hope that it will help to slow the rise of obesity among our citizens. in 2014. Let me tell you something about Chick V. And I see the Chick V expert in the front here. <laughs> Chick V is transmitted to humans from the bite of infected female mosquitoes. And I'm doing some knowledge transfer now. The mosquito bites in the daytime. Some people miss that fact, you know. <laughs> which speaks in the morning and early afternoon. The mosquito, the Aedes aegypti, bites inside and outside. Prevention and control of an outbreak rely on reducing the number of natural and artificial water-filled container habitats that support breeding of the mosquito. I believe that in 2014, every Jamaican became an expert on chick -fil. It is true to say that the government's management of the chick outbreak in Jamaica was less than stellar at the outbreak of the, at the outset. In the beginning, there appeared to be some attempt to downplay the seriousness of the outbreak. Downplaying bad news is a familiar political response and part of the public relations reflex. However, this attempt did not hold against the live reality of people being infected. The country lost valuable time in engaging in what I describe as a delusional phase. Once reality kicked in, the health communication campaign was ruled out. The government of the day ultimately declared a national emergency so as to direct resources to the control of the outbreak. So slowly, we ramped up our national response. Spraying was increased. Spraying is politically expedient and has additional value of killing mature mosquitoes. Spraying suits community affairs, a health and political imperative. However, the population must be educated to open their windows, and children should be told that it is not safe to, ch to chase the spring trucks throughout their community. The medical doctors at the Ministry of Health who marshaled the national HIV HIV response needed the mass media to carry information. Commentators opined that the principal messengers should have been willing to respond to difficult questions in a transparent way. Attempts to withhold information can be interpreted as obfuscation that can lead to confusion among the people. On one of his programs, Nationwide at Five, I recall Cliff Hughes chiding the acting chief medical officer as she appeared to be less than forthcoming in her response about the size of the outbreak. 
However, un I understand why some health professionals are reticent to fully disclose. Some are still influenced by the period of patriarch patriarchy in medicine, during which patients and the general public are entitled to very little information. Patients feared asking for information and sought clarification from alternate sources, such as family, friends, and informal practitioners. I see a corollary with health communication practice in the early years of the 20th century, when it was felt that too much information about a drug, for instance, can increase curiosity about the drug, driving experimentation and use. That thinking has changed, I mean. We now live in an age when the consumer has a right to know. We give people information and they have a right to make their choices. Today we are providing health information to more informed patients who may have studied up on the internet. And to some of our patients, the internet is authoritative health information and treatment guide. In relation to Chick V, unfortunately, some persons died from conditions exacerbated by Chick V. Many work hours were lost. Some persons still live with lingering disabilities. It is fair to say that the country, the political and health system learned a great deal from the Chick V experience. As the incidence of Chick V diminished, Zik V and Ebola were on the horizon. However, in the cases of Zigbee and Apollo, Jamaica was in a proactive mode. The health system signaled its readiness to confront these threats. Jamaica was spared the deadly Ebola. Unfortunately, some of our children were born, were born with cardiac deficits related to Zigbee. Data reported by the Ministry of Health record that between 2016 and 2018, there were 9,000 reported cases of Zigvi, 600 Zika in pregnancy cases, and over 100 congenital Zika syndrome cases. Monitoring is ongoing, and that is a good thing. So if we did not lay lay at the start of the outbreak of Chigbi, could we have reduced the burden on, of the infection on Jamaica? I believe so. I can also share with you that during that lay lay period, my pharmacist colleagues, major custodians of paracetamol or panadol, were re reporting unusually high levels of public purchase of the drug. They felt then that something was out of kilter. Ladies and gentlemen, do we learn from negative experiences? Maybe, although some health communication theorists tell us that focusing on positive outcomes is more effective than negative aspects. From Chick V and other mosquito borne illnesses, I believe could benefit greatly from an integrated response. I understand the difficulty of measuring impact of bundled prevention programs, but individual markers can be set. Sustained campaigns such as Not Dutty Up Jamaica present a ready opportunity for including a mosquito eradication focus. I conclude with some thoughts on substance abuse prevention programs. These interventions occupied a central role in my dissertation. In 2005, indigenous drug abuse prevention campaigns were in their infancy. We were at the tail end of the American war on drugs with its focus on introduction, inter interdiction. New notions of therapeutic justice were emerging. We had a good foundation of data collection, including surveys to identify prevention needs. We benefited from the sur surveys done by pioneers in substance abuse research, including Rubin and Comitus, Carl Stone, Barry Chavans, and Ken Garfield D Douglas, to name a few. We had researched the significance of Gyanja to Rastafari and considered the implications and consequences of the recommendations of the Chavans Commission in the year 2000, and foresaw a mixed message conundrum. We had the opportunity to develop a new generation of indigenous health communication programs for Jamaica and the Caribbean. The name of our first campaign was the Project Squeaky. The intervention had a robust theoretical framework and required a pre- and post-intervention test with a quasi-experimental design using active and controlled groups for measuring results statistically. The intervention targeted low-level literacy children. 
We were going to measure factors such as exposure, preferred media sources, preferred human sources of information and knowledge. We needed 10,000 students to participate in the project. I was able to complete the pilot phase with 583 children without the bells and whistles. It was an uphill task to implement the national component. In fairness, the top management of the National Council of Drug Abuse supported my work. However, some members of the NCDA board, primarily medics, were very cynical about this behavior change thingy. <laughs> and <laughs> this cost, dismissed it as bulla work. Others in the field who were pursuing a social development approach model felt that the theoretical abstractions in which I was engaged was antithetical to the practical. So while I had finally reached a satisfactory phase with my theoretical work, I found myself on a sticky wicket. Then like manna from heaven, my project proposal received full funding from the US Embassy in Jamaica. In the end, 5,759 students participate in the pretest and 3,945 in the post-test. The funds assisted greatly in carrying out the survey and the NCDA agency officers were willing to plan supporting events in their communities. I will not claim that all went swimmingly. There was continuous pushback, but I was able to complete the project with this, without the support of the field team, I could not have succeeded. We created the first compact design for an indigenous Caribbean substance abuse prevention program. It had a theoretical framework, relevant related activities with a fixed frame, time frame for execution and measurable outputs and indicators of success. The that design was efficient and facilitated assessment of effectiveness. Statistically, we did show some changes after 12 months. We also developed a composite for the, the intention to use model that allowed us to, to ad adapt that model for Caribbean purposes. Squeak is now a copyrighted drug abuse prevention program that has predictive potential. It is a highly memorable, graphically powerful, and exciting intervention. Nevertheless, it would be necessary for me to return to the field to confirm to what extent behavior change was achieved. The success of behavior change remains proved in praxis. Ladies and gentlemen, as I conclude, I want to state that a quantitative weight of the value of political support for or opposition to health community campaigns has not been assigned. We postulate that politics is pervasive and its power is persuasive because we have witnessed its effect. This power does not, is, may not necessarily be supportive of the noble goals of health, communi health communication campaigns. This power can be disruptive and obstructive. However, we know that if we plan to massage negative political influence or sustain positive support we increase our chances of completing the planned intervention with the prospect of achieving appropriate attitude shifts and behavior modification. The evidence is that culturally relevant, well-designed, meticulously planned, and well-executed health communication campaigns can subvert the negative designs of political forces. The provision of knowledge in ways that it assumes the authority of truth is powerful and can persuade individuals and groups to act in a positive or in negative ways. I am convinced that in the field of health communication, the source of this authoritative knowledge must be based on science, translated in understandable ways. This aspect of health research translation requires the ongoing distillation of scientific facts into the community in ways that can inoculate our society. To extend the public health analogy, according to Evans, frequent booster shots are needed to engage consistently the public attention around the health issue. It is not easy to break through the cacophony that obtains in the current media landscape. However, the combined skills, competences, and resources of health scientists and health communication experts 
should form a potent force of science-based truth tellers that should get the job done. Such a unit or collaborative center should aim to be recognized as a fulcrum of knowledge and authoritative reference source for information that will help to combat myths, beliefs, and perceptions. Professor Agri contended that this field of health communication is a contested space. He was right then and now. For whatever their origins, there are ingrained concepts that have assumed the authority of truth in the minds of individuals and ethos of communities. Nevertheless, relevant theories, smart and pragmatic health communication planning, and relentless program execution can even the odds of message penetration. Finally, a society armed with knowledge that has assumed the authority of truth can overcome the hurdle of negative political interference. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for your attention. Comments. Good evening. Partisan politics you're asking me about. Uh, <laughs> All right. It can. It can. Um, but I don't want to just leave my response at that. I want to perhaps add the fact that there are other forces at work. When you say JLP or PNP, there are other underlying forces at work that will direct policy one way or the other. I will tell you my experience, and Barbara is here, with, when it came to the tobacco campaign. I did a lot of the underlying research, as you call, in terms of giving us the numbers. And we went through two administrations um, lobbying for that policy change. And with the first administration, for some reason, we could not get any traction. And I think in terms of Dr. Fenton Ferguson, who was in another administration, it was perhaps because he was a dentist, a health person, that he took what, I, what was really a risk for him to get that piece of legislation through. I understand he paid a, a price, a heavy price for it for having made that decision. So sometimes it's not just because the person may be JLP or PNP, you know, you know, thing. I think it has to do with many of the underlying factors that drive policy. The lobby people, the very wealthy people, um, people are making money from tobacco, still are, and all of those factors combine. Um, and I don't, well, I'm not trying to say one party is more wicked than the other. That is not where I'm going with this. I'm saying that there are other variables that may affect the decision one way or the other. Night. I would, I, I would I, I'd, I'd like to use examples when I answer. Let us go back to the Chick V. At the start of the outset, the minister tried to be the face of the response. And I think that is a tendency of some of our politicians. 
I would like to see a professional, technical, perhaps health communication person be the face of the response. Because although all politicians are important, they can be a lightning rod for partisan responses, and you don't get a whole of nation response to the thing. So I really would like to see that kind of response um, be led, perhaps by a technical person, communication person, a unit that will take up a thing and run with it. And politicians can speak, you know, you can't tell them not to open their mouth, but I think the response should be led by some some persons within the ministry who have the, res, have the requisite expertise and knowledge to do so. Dr. Grizzle, the two is better than too many campaign. Mm -hmm. I believe it's one of the most successful campaigns in Jamaica. I can mm -hmm. remember distinctly the mother, the father, and two children. Yes. Describe for us what was happening before that. What caused the campaign? You spoke earlier about community-based activities. Mm -hmm. Aside from community-based activities, what other steps were taken? Why, or measures, why the campaign was so successful? I, uh, I am not sure. I know we had a very high level of fertility, high fertility rate. I said in the 1970s we were at 4.1, and we are now at almost replacement level, and people are wondering if that's a good place to be, but <laughs> because we won't be able to replace ourselves shortly. But so that was really what drove the, the and the impact of people having so many children on education, professional development, poverty, and a number of other issues that was recognized that you needed to have some kind of family planning campaign. And they had an a excellent model, which included messaging, as I said. Um, you had the community development. You had field officers, people in the field, actually carrying the message, like the community network, which Bandura describes as, a, as something that's important. You had a media campaign that was very powerful. Um, Two, two is better than too many, and all kinds of books and posters, uh, radio shows, all kinds of things were into the camp, right. So you had a whole panoply of, 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 of media responses added to the program. I believe that maybe we withdrew the community-based component perhaps too quickly and that it was, or should I say it was not phased out properly, it was kind of a, rem remove that and put in the technology, which is the, 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 the emergency contraceptive pill. And uh, we have seen some consequences of that, some negative consequences of that, quite frankly, um, as to what is meaning in terms of our young people and the use of the emergency contraceptive without planning and all of that, which is very important in terms of family planning. I believe a very important factor was that community-based um, part of the, the, the response. I recognize that's a very expensive thing to do. And so, Bundled, pro bundled programs that I call where you put a number of health issues together. We need to be using that approach more. I know we use the community health aids now to carry the message, but bundled prevention programs that can be conveyed to the community, where you have, like as I said, you have mosquito programs and, and not of the Jamaica, may be used as a part of the response at this time. I think, I think the community-based somehow is missing now from the prevention program. That's what I, I, I really am of the view that we need to look at it now. And I know that Dr. Pauline is here from, from Farm Plan. And um, perhaps we can have some discussions as to, as to where we go now. Good evening. Good evening. 
How can I, as a young person, improve the discourse of health communication? Um, I think, and I was having a little talk with Dr. Donner about young people and their perspectives and perhaps their strengths in the area of social, social media. Um, and I think that is where the young people can help in the messaging, I think. But also in that peer-to-peer -peer influencing. That peer-to-peer -peer influencing because young people like yourself believe, would believe more from another young people like themselves. It's just, it's just the way how we communicate. So if you become informed, and I really mean informed, <laughs> not to carry forward the myths and the, and the misperceptions, if you become informed and being a person who can influence your peers, I think that's a very important way to contribute to this business of health communication. Dr. Campbell Grizzly, you made You made mention of the patriarchal way in which medicine, uh, medicine and health communication is practiced in Jamaica. How soon do you envision a change in that regard, considering the very recent occurrences that have proved that it is still thriving? I don't know if it's thriving, but I know it still exists. Um, but we are now, quite frankly, in terms of our periods, in terms of where we are now. We are now, frankly, in the age of consumerism. I think patriarchy in medicine is an, over, is an overhang. It's, it's not something that is central now to how people think about conveying information to patients. I'm a pharmacist. And there's a time when they deleck the, the information in your package. The, the sheet was removed. You are not supposed to know what that does. Your prescriptions were written in Latin. That meant that you were not supposed to know what is on that prescription. Even sometimes the pharmacist didn't know what was written on that prescription. <laughs> because the doctors were really terrible in terms of their writing. But I think we've moved forward. When, I have, when patients come before me now, some of them know more about, about the, their condition than it's their condition, it's their illness. And so what you do is you give them the options. I think I would like to say that the era of patriarchy is waning. And I would like to be optimistic to suggest that we are now in the age of consumerism. And that, I hope, remains with us for a very long time. OK. Hello. Good evening. It's me again. Hi. <laughs> OK, oh. I have another question. Yes. All right. So the. HIV campaign titled Faces of HIV was able to assist a bit in removing some of the stigma that was associated with HIV and AIDS. However, the stigma is still a major issue. Uh, how do you believe we can you know, go about reducing the stigma that exists around HIV and AIDS? I hear you. I think there has been improvement in stigma. I was looking at a study that was done for our Fury Jamaica project the tolerance index I was talking about. And you can see that in terms of social distancing, when we do that, one of the questions had to do with social distancing, people prefer to have in their neighborhood somebody with HIV than somebody who is, is, a, is LGBT. Um, so pro progress is, 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 is being made. I think, as with all things, the more you know, the more people who know people who have HIV or AIDS, the more you closer you move to removing the stigma and the discrimination. And so, if a campaign can help to, apart from the media messaging, to help to bring people together in groups where they sit and talk, people who have, people who don't, and bring them together in conversation, or dialogue is the proper word. I think that is, more of some of that is needed. Um, and you have some strong advocates for HIV AIDS now. Um, a lot of people now who themselves have HIV and AIDS are now advocating for themselves. So I think with time we are gonna get there. I think we need more dialogue though, and when I said dialogue, I mean not 
blogs or so on. I need face-to-face -face dialogue between people who have HIV and people who don't. I think that helps when you know somebody who has, who has the, the condition. And I think, I w you didn't ask me this, but I want to say this. Again, because I'm coming from a health perspective. The fact that we know of medicines that, ca that can help people with HIV AIDS to live a normal life means that we have to be ever vigilant in terms of our prevention message. Because the, that, that tendency, because you can, live, you can live a normal life, you tend to forget that you must, your meds have to be taken, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I, I added that, you didn't ask me that, but I added it because I think it is so, so, so very important. Thank you very much, Dr. Grizzle. That was supposed to be your final question, but okay. before you go, I would like to ask you a question about the role of language in uh, health communication. Now, we live in a country with two languages operating side by side, Jamaican Creole and English. In the past, we used English to transfer information about health, but I noticed that recently we have been doing, well, not quite, not very, you know, it, it, it has yeah. been going on for some time now, Jamaican Creole. But in Creole, there are some terms that are not in English. Do you have a problem with transferring meaning, with transferring interpretation from la one language to the next in terms of your campaigns? Okay, um, I'm not a linguist, but I'm a student of Professor Brown. <laughs> and therefore, Therefore, is a question I think I am prepared to answer. I do not have a problem with the translation from Creole, from English to Creole, in terms of our, in terms of our um, health, health communication messages. But I'm going to tell you something. I sat through a patwa debate last week, and I learned something. Anytime I'm, again, I'm going to translate from English to Pato, I'm going to find a linguist who can help me to do it. I'm telling you, because you need to get the accurate reflection of it. I sat through that debate with students from both universities, UTEC and UWE, and I realized. That's because one word doesn't mean another. That's right. Uh, so if I'm going to do something, probably in English, if I'm going to put it to Pato, I have to find a linguist who is going to help me to do it. That, that, that is something that I remember because of that debate. It's amazing. It's amazing. But even some of us who were there realized that we couldn't talk that well. I'm telling you, we, we, just, we were just out of our depth. So it's a good question. I respect the, the business of transference of meaning. And I understand that you meet people in terms of health communication. If you are going to word, use words or voice or whatever, you meet people at the best way, where they can understand what you're saying. And health language, although I understand health, if I'm going to do that translation to Pato, I still going to find somebody to help me because I recognize that my limitations are on the Pato side. Thank you very much thought-provoking, riveting. <laughs> Thank you so much. Another round of applause. I'm going to ask you to stand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Grizzly. This evening's proceedings was planned. We're almost at the end in collaboration with a team of final year communication analysis and planning that's CAP2 students in Caramac's Integrated Marketing Communication Undergraduate Degree Program. At this point, I'd like to ask them to come to the front of the room to be acknowledged. Peter Gay Pennant. I'm gonna ask you to applause, to applaud as they make their way to the front of the room. Celine Dion Ferguson, 
Can you sing? <laughs> Brittany Clark, Andrew Williams, Chelsea Butor, Alison Wright, Andrelin Gooden, Kimone Harris, and uh, Crystal Dennis. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause. Thank you, students. Thank you so much. Well done. And we will now ask Miss Kimone Gooden as they make their way off the, um, from the front of the room. We will ask Miss Kimone Harris to remain. And she will, she has some surprises and prizes and giveaways and stuff like that for the audience. lucky so I'm going to ask everyone to look under your seat and if you see a piece of paper you may be lucky Okay, so if you have found a piece of paper, you could just join me at the front here. If you found a piece of paper under your chair, you could join me at the front here. Okay, piece of we paper have one winner thus far. A weekend for two? <laughs> Is your saying a weekend for two? A trip to Barbados? Anybody with a trip to Barbados? <laughs> You're bad. Huh? <laughs> Come, you could join me here as well. Okay, so you will just state what you have on your paper, and then from there on, we'll tell you what you'll, you've won. So, good evening, everybody. My paper says, Smile, Smart, Dental Care. Awesome. So, at this time, I'll invite a representative from Smile, Smart, Dental Care to present mm -hmm. you with a gift voucher. <laughs> And share with us what you have on your paper as well. Mine also says smile, smart, dental care. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Hello, I'm what do you have on your paper? Mine says national. Okay, national. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> I do hope you enjoy your goodies. What do you have on your paper? Mine also says national. <laughs> national? We have one last lucky member. What do you have you on today? Oh, you also have national. <laughs> Thank you all for being a part of the Agri Brown Distinguished Lecture 2019. Thank you very much, Ms. Harris. And we will now have Andrew Lynn Gooden with a vote of thanks. Health communication is a topic that needs much exploring in the Jamaican Health Center sector. 
Masters of Ceremonies, Mr. Dean McLeod. Deputy Dean of Graduate Studies and Research, Yui Mona, Professor Donna Hope. Director of the Caribbean School of Media and Communication, Dr. Livingston White. President of the University of Technology, Jamaica, Professor Stephen Vassiani. Dr. Susan Francis Brown, wife of the late Professor Agri Brown and other members of the family. Featured speaker, Dr. Ellen Campbell Grizzle, Associate Professor at the University of Technology, faculty and staff of the University of the West Indies and the University of, Jam of Technology, Jamaica. Other specially invited guests, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. On behalf of the planning committee of the ninth annual Carmack Agar Brown Distinguished Lecture, a tongue twister. I would like to extend our appreciation for your presence here this evening. I would also like to express gratitude to our speaker, Dr. M. Ellen Campbell Grizzle, for her phenomenal lecture that gave us invaluable insights on the politics of health communication. We say thank you to the Caramac team who guided us through the planning process. Dr. Livingston White, Director of Caramac. Dr. Nova Gordon-Bell, and Mr. Alpha Obika. We thank all the staff and students of Caramac who gave us their support in this effort. We'd like to say a very special thanks to our sponsors, Grace Foods, Nescafe, St. Mary's Banana Chips, National Baking Company Limited, Wisinko, Footprints Cafe, Gift Guru, and Smile Smart Dental Care. We also say thanks to our MC, Ms. Nadine McLeod, who ably guided us throughout this evening's proceedings. To all our patrons and partners, thank you. I am confident that the effort invested in the organization of this event will make it a memorable one for all of us. With your continued support, Caramac, a Brown Distinguished Lecture, will continue to grow bigger and better for years to come. Ladies and gentlemen, applaud yourselves, for you are now part of the legacy, the Agri Brown legacy. Thank you. I would now like to invite Miss, uh, oh, a member of my team, <laughs> to do a presentation. All right, so good evening again, everyone. So on behalf of the planning team, I would like to make a presentation to two persons in the room this evening, and namely, those are Dr. Livingston White and Alpha Obika. <laughs> right, so as Angeline rightly said, they guided us through the process, you know, endless meetings, correction after correction. Of course, we had to ensure that we did everything, you know, fit into meet the Agri Brown legacy. So it was a lot of hard work, but we really tried to execute and we hope that our grade, you know, goes well at the end of it. Okay, so we also have a presentation to make to our guest speaker, Dr. Ellen Campbell Grizzle.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Clap yourselves. Clap yourselves. You have been a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful audience. I know it was said before, but we are going to once again woo, thank the sponsors, Nescafe, National Bakery Company Limited, Gift Guru, with Cinco St. Mary Banana, St. Mary's Banana Chips, Smile Smart Dental Care, Grace Foods, and Footprints Cafe. Thank you so much for your contribution. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being here for this very special occasion and for making it yet another successful year. We look forward to seeing you next year and the year after and the year after and the year after. You, you get the gist. Enjoy the rest of the evening. We have refreshments. You can join us for refreshments. Thank you very much. You have, there, there is, a, thank you for, for that reminder. There is an evaluation exercise. There's an evaluation sheet. Where's the evaluation sheet? At the back of the room, there's an evaluation sheet. If you could just assist us um, with that. Thank you very much.